the alternative dig talk real issues real talk Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Fellow citizens, following the sequence of events, Uganda seems to be at political crossroads. I'm not a servant of anybody. <laughs> Madam, I know the law. <laughs> As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation, as he confirms. I'll be always here Saturday from 10 a.m in the morning be there don't miss the live discussion on the alternative uganda digital tv facebook pages and the alternative uganda youtube channel you have got to get up pretty early to go do something We are the Alternative Dig Talk. With our mobile studios, we are redefining TV presentation just as technology is setting the pace. We are blending our approach with fresh, perspectively designed breakfast show the Mighty Drive, informative and entertainment show, exclusive and live interviews. Well, President Museveni, what did you use the number of a Pimaka Unga Kilo Billy? That's over a Kalia. Nini Wavaria Kilo Tan. We are Nemokulis, Iguanga Nebody Moon de Killer. Jagara Queva Zad, the alternative digi talk. It was the Kanoka Mighty Drive. Era Nava to Uliza, Bona, Abari Kumikutu, Jagara Basaba Mugi, no mass or no Uliza. All given to you, just a click away on your phone, tablet, laptop, and smart TVs. As we are streaming live on our social media platforms, on the road and on the go. We are the Alternative Dig Talk. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. A very, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to today's edition of the Hotline. My name is Roger Studiabu, and it's a humble privilege and pleasure to be here to serve you in this capacity today. I believe and I know that most of you have been used to me uh, being on the mighty drive and other things and, and not commonly on this one. But today, for reasons that are unavoidable, uh, Comrade uh, Abdalatif was not able to be here. And so he asked me to sit in for him. So don't worry. Please sit tight. We are going to have the discussion as it always happens here at the hotline. And today we have a distinguished guest, one we have had before, particularly on, on issues of national importance as someone who has actually been a leader in the national uh, parliament at the National Assembly and we're going to be looking at a number of things uh, on, 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 you know, human rights violations. We want to look at, you know, the, 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 the rule of law as it happens around here. We want to look at a number of things really. 
want to look at the debt burden, Uganda, you, you, you realize that now at this position in time, we actually, our national debt is, stands at 80 trillion Uganda shillings. And, and, and this keeps multiplying. And now someone would, would, would you know, ask what, what exactly do we borrow for, seeing as most of the money that we borrow either goes through corruption, goes to a number of things that are not intended, or is spent in agendas that are not the sp sp spending targets for, the, for which those monies were borrowed. And so we want to look at a number of these things, where that leaves us as a country, but also how much of that can go into the development. We understand that usually, according to research, about, I think, 97% of our internal local revenue collected, about 97% goes to recurrent expenditures. That means government expenditures that happens over time. means, you know, administrative costs, a number of things that government runs time again and again. And, 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 and also uh, servicing the debts that we have, the foreign debts that we have. Now, if we have our debt, our foreign debt, going up every time and again, the national debt expanding and multiplying and tripling, it means that literally our budget, if the money that we collect locally goes into servicing and, and, and covering the recurrent expenditures, it so much means that almost the money that runs our national budget is actually borrowed. It means we will have to be borrowing almost every other year for us to be able to, 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 you know, to fund our national budget. And so a number of these things are the ones we are going to be looking at. We want to look at the state of insecurity, uh, the police raids that have happened here and there, and, and, and what that also means, but also the implication of uh, the merging of police. You know, some polices, police you know, posts have been merged, others just withdrawn from those locations. And, and obviously that must have in the long run the impact in the society that these uh, particular uh, police stations were. So we want to look at how do we counter that. And we also want to look at the Alliance for National Transformation, being that our guest today is one who comes from the NT and one of the leaders in that particular party. We want to look at what is their agenda, how far are they they, they seem to not be felt, you know, largely in community and want to understand what they are doing to counter that particular narrative. And uh, the year is ending. We want to also see and understand what the agenda is going to be like in the next year. And so a number of things as such are the ones you're going to be looking at. And, and, and what you just need to do is uh, sit tight and listen in. And in the second hour, we'll give you the opportunity to be able to send in your questions. You can put in your comments on our social media platforms, the Alternative Uganda and the Dig Talk TV, our Facebook uh, handles, and we'll be able, I'll be able to read those comments in the second hour. But also, you can participate in the discussion, ask the questions. The Honorable is going to be answering those questions myself. I'm going to make sure that we are as objective as possible. Well, I am going to try to make sure that that happens because it is important for these discussions because especially for the people who have been leaders here, it is important to understand their positions and views on particular issues because their perspectives actually shape what happens in our societies. And so the Honorable is going to be here to look uh, to us, uh, to tell us a number of those things. Uh, the other thing we will be looking at is uh, recently we had uh, a conference, I think it was a, called an accountability conference that happened in uh, Kenya, Nairobi, and uh, it had most of the opposition parties. It had the National Unity Platform. It had the Alliance for National Transformation. It also had the FDC, which I think was represented by the former presidential aspirant, Colonel Chiza BCJ. And, and I think even the party president, uh, Patrick Oboya Moriat, was actually also in attendance. And so we want to look at what were the objectives of this meeting and, and what should we as Ugandans expect. And Honorable was actually one of those people who attended that meeting. And so we want to understand and get the insights straight from her and, and know if that is actually going to be also useful to us as Uganda, or if that was actually, you know, fruitful. We had recently the general, a retired Major General Kaindo Tafiri saying that what they did is actually tantamount to treason, and, and we want to understand what that also means to them. Uh, allow me to welcome the Honorable who has joined me in studio. A very good evening, Honorable. Good evening, Chief. It is very good to have you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Viewers, I have to first apologize for the many times I've been uh, requested to attend. They publicize that I will be available mm. and circumstances don't allow me to come. Mm. I must sincerely apologize to you and to the hotline, the Digitalk viewers and all of you 
friends, brothers and sisters. Mm. My sincere apologies to you for not fulfilling that obligation. Uh, apology accepted, I accept it on their behalf. Uh, <laughs> Honorable, uh, first off, uh, before we get in the official business, I think the last time we had an engagement is when you were visiting the vision leaders and I come bearing their thankfulness okay. towards your attendance and okay. for the insights we had. Okay. But moving on, uh, Honorable, we want to begin a uh, write-off uh, with uh, the Alliance for National Transformation for which you come from mm. and, and uh, what, what the agenda is like. We have seen it has, I think it has been, it has lived for some time now and uh, most of the people, some people at least those we usually interact with would, would, would say that we, we haven't felt the party so much. Most of the people actually admire Huna, uh, the general which which amount as an individual and the people you yourself uh, the ambassador Sempala and the likes they are people really of principle but they feel like the party is not so much felt I, I i wonder why that is honorable i want to thank all those who wish the alliance for national transformation well mm. i want to thank them and i continue to say please support us to grow support us to be felt support us to be part of the discussions that mm. you will want to hear. Mm. The Alliance for National Transformation, like we kept telling you, was born at a time when Uganda was in turmoil. Mm. At a time when we were born, that is three years ago, mm. we were preparing to go for the elections, but we were hit by COVID, and so we didn't hit the road as we would have hit it. Mm. Well, when COVID was uh, dealt with, and thankfully, and we thank God that it was dealt with the yeah, way it was dealt with, we now thought of impacting on the road mm. to ensuring we build our structures. We believe in the building of structures. We believe in bringing together like-minded Ugandans mm. who are values-based, who believe in God. Because some of our, our, our values as, as a political party is mm. godliness, values-based political yeah. leadership. Mm. We believe in time management. We believe in conflict resolution. And we know that with Ugandans who believe in these principles and these values mm. will join us. Mm we have set our ball rolling. Mm. At a time when we wanted to set the ball rolling, again, that is when Ebola came in. But we are glad that it was dealt with very fast and the situation normalized. Mm. The party leadership and the party members are impacting on what we believe in best, building of the structures. We have done this in West Nile. We have done this in Northern Uganda. We are doing this in eastern Uganda, and we shall continue doing this in the whole country. This After doing the issue of, uh, you, you know people think we, we kept quiet. Uh, immediately after elections, we went into the exercise of meeting our leaders. Mm. How was the campaign? What did the people say? Why do you think we got the votes that we, we got? got yes. Why do you think people didn't give us the votes that we expected to get? Mm. And out of these consultations that we had with our leaders, together with the consultations that we later had with all those who were our candidates, because mm. that is what we did immediately, we finished elections, mm. meeting our candidates, asking them what the challenges were, asking them what they thought we should have done better, and how they think we should move going forward. So, so, so Sorry yes. to cut you short. So in these consultations one would assume that you came up with a, co a conclusion and a solution to the reason why the party got that much votes that they got. And so one would want to understand, our viewers, to make them understand what could have been the reasons why the, the, the votes were few and, and maybe the reason for which... You and actually it is, it, is, exactly. it is what we believe in. Mm. Reason being we are not firm on the ground by the time we went into elections. Yes, right. So we didn't have enough base on the ground. One of the reasons why we have now impact on the exercise of building structures so that when we are going into the next set of elections, mm. should they happen, we have these mobilizers from LOC1 mm. up to national level. Then we can be able now to go into the exercise of identifying candidates who will be supported by the structures that were put in place. Mm. And during these uh, interactions and meetings, 
we got to understand that there is something we should do. And so as a political party, we are working on a strategic plan, mm. a strategic plan which we shall unveil to the population so that they can be able to follow us. Mm. We also uh, appreciate the fact that we didn't have enough funds, and so we are impacting on a fundraising drive to ensure that we have the sufficient resources to enable us to do what we want to do. Mm. So some of those reasons uh, th that make people feel that we are not feeling them the way we needed to feel them mm. are those. We didn't have sufficient structures. We didn't have enough time to concentrate yeah, and possibly mobilize. Yes. And so it is what we are doing. But we want to first build our structures before we go into aggressive mobilization. Mm. We want those who believe in us, in our principles, to be on those committees. Mm. Then it will be those who believe in our principles. Also, after getting the necessary training, mm. enabling them to understand our values and principles, mm. then they can be able to go out and mobilize, marketing people to join us after knowing what they are preaching. So do you, do you feel like at the projection where you stand right now, because as you say, it means at this moment, we're embarking at the mobilization, the, yes. the, the, the grassroots Grass recruitment, mobilization, uh, recruitment, yeah, yeah. And, and preaching of the values of the parties. Preaching of well. the values of the parties and putting in place leadership structures. Does it so far feel like, uh, because we have about four years, I think about four, three now, three and a because half. this one has ended really. Three and a half. Yeah, about three years yeah. to get to another election. Yes. Do you feel by projection that by 2026, the party will be in good position. The party well will be in good to be position to, to field the candidates, and I'm sure by that time everybody will be feeling it. Mm. Yes. Okay. Let's hope to. Uh, we hope don't so. want to serve and, and to Ugandans half baked food. That's right. And we want to walk the talk. Mm. When we say we believe in institutions, we want Ugandans to speak. Mm. Party activities will stall because the chairman of the party, who is at the same time the president of the Republic of Uganda, is out of the country. And members will tell you we are still waiting for the president to come out so that the, the party organs sit. Because the party and the state are merged. People will say, but it's because the party is the one that is in power. The party is different from the leaders in power. Except now for the problem, Honorable is one. We have seen in the, uh, the recent past when Honorable Mao joined, became the Minister for Constitutional Affairs and yes. Justice. A lot of people are saying he has crossed, he has gone, you know, in their government, so he has literally become an RM. It, it leaves the question of, does it have to be the leadership in power to be able to be the ones to run the government entirely? You know, because there is nothing that talks about a government of national unity mm. that people would have maybe gotten used to. Mm. Well, it might have happened before, but it happens with individuals. That is why when the Honorable Mao went, there was resistance within the Democratic Party. Yes. Because the institution was not fully prepared. When the Honorable OHT Joyce Sebogwao went mm, from, FDC. from the FDC, mm. the FDC remained, some section of the party confused. was confused, was disorganized and said, how could this happen? Because it did not happen using the structures of the party. Otherwise, if it had been a call to all political parties, let's talk about political parties that have a presence in the parliament. Mm. And they say to you, the political parties that have a presence in the parliament, we would like to have a government of national unity. Can you all say what we can do as a country? Mm. We would have understood the goodwill. But what we know is that Museven is just using patronage. He's reaching out to a few individuals in opposition political parties mm. and telling them, come, we work together, them. come, we work together. Mm. But by the time they come, they are vulnerable now to speak like they are in opposition. Mm. So, and the unfortunate bit is that he gives them positions that will put them on the front line with their party members. Mm. Mm. The Honorable Betty, I, uh, OHT is in, in, is in, is in, is in uh, communications. Uh, communications, yes. So basically, he's supposed to be speaking what the government of President Museveni is doing, <laughs> whether it is right or wrong. 
supposed to defend it. Mm. There are constitutional issues that Ugandans have talked about and they want corrected. Mm. And we know that President Museven is not about to have them corrected. He puts Mao into constitutional affairs. When things fail, he will say, you know what? You members of the opposition, it was your it opposition was member your your who was in that seat that mm. was not doing the right things. Mm. Not me. Ask Mao. So there Mao is going to carry Museven's cross. Mm. And so to me, well, I thank them. They are Ugandans. They are entitled to serve their country. But coming from political party, was there a mechanism that brings the political parties on board? Is there a mechanism that allows all the political actors in the political party, maybe the, the party organs, mm. to even have a say on when a member leaves and when a member comes back? It is the same thing that happened to UPC when the Honorable Beta Mongi went. went. Mm. It was an that agreement is. between Betty and President Museveni. It wasn't a UPC position. Mm. So there is a way he has made people vulnerable and he uses that vulnerability to begin fishing. But, but now is that, is that a problem of the president Museven as an individual or for the parties themselves? It's not because the parties, maybe it is the individuals because the parties have remained. Yeah, the party remained, but now the problem is every time they, like you said, remain vulnerable. So now that they have fetched, let's say, uh, the DP president, the president himself, Nobat Mo, one yes. Nobat Mo, the next time they will come and say we need uh, probably surrender, and then they go, he goes and does a particular thing. So they, does the party learn from these things that they now get prepared when they take one of their own? They get prepared to know that next time this could actually also happen, so let's prepare. Well, sure now, it it, I, I think it is now incumbent upon individuals. It is, it is a choice for an individual. Mm. I may not put it against the parties. I may not say, you members, be on the lookout. No, mm. it's an individual choice. Mm. I know there are so many members who are from possibly the opposition that have been reached out to, mm. but some, not all of them have taken up the offer. Yeah, that's right. Because they believe there isn't much that is going to change in President Museveni's regime. That is why you saw at the beginning of his uh, leadership as a Minister of Constitutional Affairs, the Honorable Mao was telling us he went there to negotiate a peaceful transition. Mm. But Museven was quick to say, no, 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 that was not that part was... of our agenda with Mao. <laughs> we didn't speak about anything so, like that. We did not speak about anything like that. Mm. Uh, they are somehow you're made to look ugly. Yeah, that's right. So some of the issues that Mao thought he was going to talk about, they have told him from the word go, please. That's not one of them. Don't talk about that because that was not one of them. Mm. So it leaves him guessing what other things from the pact that we signed is he going to knock out. So we put the blame to Museven for not honoring the pact or for... Well, the we... unfortunate bit is that that pact has not come out to the public. Okay. Mm. Because eventually when we went to the front line and Mao was saying, yes, I can say it was not part of the things. And yet... A few days before that statement said. was made, he had said <laughs> part of the things we were talking about is a peaceful he transition. He in fact said the agenda was driven by the need for a peaceful uh -huh. transfer. So he's changing so position. somehow until possibly the two of them decide to make the document mm -hmm. public and they all own it, now that is where the issue of accountability comes in. Mm -hmm. When you go into an agreement like that, who is supposed to follow up and ensure that the contents of the agreement mm. are right, followed right, to the yes, latter? Yes. And what are the remedies in case you feel that the contents of the agreement have been violated? Because when you go into such an agreement with a, in an organized way, mm, you are not be. looking at yourself as an individual and you are looking at the common good of all of us, mm. then there must be things talk about and you say this must be done. If we are going to work together, we are working together under certain parameters. Mm -hmm. And should this fail, then this must be put in place to ensure that we correct mm -hmm. what has mm -hmm. failed. Mm -hmm. But when you go there just like that, without creating a fallback position and ensuring that there must be someone to hold you, way, yeah. yes, there must be someone to hold each party accountable. Mm -hmm. You are susceptible to manipulation and, were, man, and manipulation. There was, there was no enforcement mechanism. So I may not be really very 
competent enough to say this is what they talked about and those that go into the the cabinet of President Museveni, this is what they talk about because he speaks to them as individuals. Mm. And even if he was to speak to them as political parties, then there would not be tensions when the member leaves the political party. Yeah. I think there was the, the other problem is that the member also go on their own. Mm. But uh, Honorable, now uh, moving away from that, you, we, I want to, you to comment about, you recently had uh, petitioned uh, a court on the Computer Misuse Act. Yes. Uh, and and uh, the contents in the act, the amendment, I think, particularly. And, and we want to understand what were your prayers? What, what are you looking at? You're, you know, somehow we learn from past experience. Mm. Sitting in that parliament for the last 15 years and under President Museveni's regime has taught me that there are no laws now that are made without him looking at himself. The constitution was changed in 2004, it was I think 2005, to remove the term limits just because he wanted to run again. In 2017, the constitution again was amended to remove the age limit to enable him to run. Along the way in 2013, there was the public, in, uh, yeah, the public Order Management, Management Act, Act yes. which was passed to suppress the opposition and stifle their operations. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we went, the police would fly the public order management and say, you are, the law does not allow yeah. you. In fact, they even put in clauses that do not exist by saying we should even ask for permission from them. While the law was saying we should inform police, the police said we are the ones to give you permission. You inform them instead of... We are supposed to inform them. Mm. I will be in this venue... At and the side. venue owner has accepted, mm. and I think that was meant to say, really, there should not be a scaffold between the convener of the meeting and the owner of the venue. Mm. But now to them, they took it that when you come to ask for permission from us, you wait for us to. You should even us. indicate that there is a venue. Yes, you have permission from the venue owner. Mm. Eventually, sometimes they would even go to the venue owner and intimidate the venue owner and say, if you allow that meeting to take place, we are doing ABCD to you. Before you know it, the person you had agreed with says, hey, come money. and have back your money. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer offering my venue. The police is all over me. So it was used to stifle the activities of those in opposition, mm -hmm. including the one member, good friend of mine, the Honorable Amam Mbabas, who was presiding over <laughs> the, the enactment, the enactment <laughs> of that coming from government <laughs> yeah. and being the one in charge of government business, the law worked on him when he also wanted to campaign. Mm. So, reading from that, we says that there is danger. When they bring the Computer Misuse Act mm. and they are saying anybody who will speak using the, co the, the computer, you write any message, that is bound to be construed to mean that you are using hate speech, then you will be arrested. But they don't go ahead to, to define what hate speech will yes. mean. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it is incumbent upon anybody who wants to hold you Accounting. responsible to say that the words you have used are hate speech. That according to, to my own according to my, uh, own, my own parameters, it yeah. is hate speech. Mm. They say if uh, someone sends a picture of anyone, you must first ask for permission of that person that I'm going to send your picture to someone. To someone. Mm. So by sharing your picture, I have to first ask for permission from you. Mm. If I see, for example, President Museveni beating up people and I get a picture of him, you should first I should President. first ask him, Mr. Museveni, <laughs> I want to share this picture with the Ugandans. Mm. So to me, I felt that really my freedoms, my rights are being suffocated. And I knew that this law was just meant to target politicians mm. and politicians who are opposed to the regime. So that is why some of us feel that the law offends the constitution, mm. 
because it stifles the rights of individuals. The law does not in any way meet the standards of a free society. Because mm. there is nobody who will find a child being beaten. By the way, do you know that there is a law that empowers me as a citizen to report when I find a child being abused? Whether a child or anybody, under the Domestic Violence Act, mm. we are supposed to report when you see that there is a someone committing an error of domestic violence. You can either report by pic taking pictures of those people, and now, maybe if it comes to minors, I can find a someone possibly raping a minor. I may not have the energy of arresting this person because the person is too big for me. Mm. What I can do is to say, at least to help the minor get redress in court. Let me send a picture and send it to someone who can who come can with. Or maybe the person is about to do the act. Let me send the picture very fast to a police officer and say, come here, there is an issue. Mm. But the law says I should first seek the consent, of, the consent the of that person and I say, hey, you are committing an error, I'm going to report you, please. Do you allow me? <laughs> How? How do you do that? <laughs> That's very so very even true. for the journalists, the journalists, for you to even begin bringing out pictures in the papers and speaking to them, you have to ask permission from the persons whom you covered mm. and say, can I use this picture? Should I send it? Should I come? Maybe. So th th that means even, even your rights of freedom of speech, free press, all those are taken away using this law. That is why some of us believe that in a society that believes in freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and a society that believes in a constitution which gives me a duty as a citizen to protect and defend that constitution, but As a constitution that tells me to be patriotic, mm. love my country, love my neighbors, be a responsible citizen, and you think I should not use all available means of technology to be responsible, then I would say that is so not true. Is and to me, I believe mm. Mm. that this is intended to again create a scaffold between those in the ruling government who have power mm, and course. those in the opposition who do not have power. And also to curtail us from the available sources of information. So, Honorable, is your contestation of this law about itself as one or about its explanation being vague and, and, and ambiguous? The law itself. Because... Leave alone the explanation. Mm. It is done in bad faith. It is not uh, allowing freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of association. But, but Honorable, isn't, isn't also people's privacy paramount? For example, you have seen the social media and how it has been. For the biggest time, you will see that people will just openly share their, their friends' information, anyone. You find something, share even if you don't know the person. You do not even know the cause, how it came to about that. Why, why, that has happened. While I am also media. aware that uh, people's freedoms must be respected, uh -huh. and my freedom must equally be respected. That's right. My freedom to share information, my freedom to enjoy the rights of uh, innovation mm -hmm. must also be respected. But also my right as a citizen to ensure that ill things, ill-mannered people do not survive in a society where we are, who are good intentioned, mm. we should be able to participate in helping police to unearth certain things. That's there is a video that a lady took. There was a man who was beating up an old woman. Mm. A lady took up this video, and this video helped a lot. Supposing she had been asked to first go and ask for the permission of this man who was beating up the old woman, would he have considered that the lady shares it? Not, not of course not. But, but then it means even these who are having street cameras should not have them. Because they are, because they are also take, they are taking pictures without our permission. Mm. 
So it will mean that also the police will do away with the street cameras. Because they are <laughs> but, taking but, people's pictures but, but, without informing them. That is why we must find the balance. Mm. There are enough laws in this country that can guide the proper management of information and encourage innovation. But by saying we are just putting a clamp on those who are innovative, those who are using internet and computers to participate in the governance of our society and pass information to the world, then we just go back to the time when Facebook was, was closed down. Mm. Because all of those happened to ensure that Ugandans don't get access to information. Mm. So even this is just depriving us of information. When you say don't share information that is not authorized, any message that you share can be construed to mean or to be interpreted as hate speech. And you don't tell us maybe what hate speech is. Honorable, to me, okay, in my opinion, yes, I would think that maybe if there was more clarity on what amounts to uh, hate speech, mm -hmm. what amounts to malicious information, I think that is one of the mm -hmm. issues that were contested. Elaboration of the whole of these clauses that were put uh, in the amendment. Mm. Maybe it would be important because you, we would both agree that there is also violation of those uh, privacies and all yeah. that stuff. So shouldn't we find a balance between making sure that the intention for which we have this uh, amendment is for the good cause, so as opposed to not having it? Where do you find that balance when you were not consulted? Do you know that the consultation was minimal with Ugandans? The law has passed. The president has assented to it. It is already a law. It has been gazetted. So at what time will you find that balance? You only have to wait to be arrested. Because the law is now law. Mm. And that is why some of us are saying, no, can we now find that balance? Because now if you must find that balance, the reason why we are in court. To say this is illegal, if you pass it, I mean, if we let it stay the way it is, it is going to offend certain sections of the Constitution. Yes, right. It is going to, offer, to curtail the aspect of freedom of speech, mm -hmm. the aspect of freedom of uh, movement, the aspect of social interaction. So can we call it illegal so that possibly the framers can now find time to move to the population and say, how do you want it to be better? But as, as it is, there is no way you are going to find a balance. The balance will be in those arresting you to say, now we have decided that you have used hate speech. <laughs> and it will not be their duty to say hate speech looks like this because mm -hmm. it is not interpreted in the law. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and I, I was looking at the political mobilization and campaigns because that's an area that most people would easily find yes. fault in. And, and they would say what someone said in the campaign trail probably is against what I, I believe in, my beliefs and something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and, and they put only the exception being the commercial advertisement. Mm -hmm. It's the only time that you can give an information that is unsolicited. Other than that, anything you give out is very unsolicited. And so I understand that you have a good cause in that uh, issue. I, I also I wanted uh, to get your uh, view actually update in that particular issue that uh, about the, the, the Kasese massacre, I understand you were for 15 years the woman MP for Kasese municipality and the first Kasese ever... Kasese district. Uh, in Kasese district, sorry. Mm -hmm. And the first ever leader of opposition, woman leader of opposition at that. Mm -hmm. We hail you for that. Uh, what, what is the progress with this whole thing, the, the, the violations, the killings that were happening? You know, maybe those are some of the issues that they don't want us to keep sharing. That's why they are now bringing in the computer misuse. I will want to say that for the last six years, mm. when that atrocity was committed to our people, nothing much has happened. Our people are still in jail. The king is still under house arrest. Mm. The 200 plus people who were arrested, a few of them were released during campaigns. The others were released, the minors mm. or the juveniles were released uh, some in the first year of the arrest. But the others are still in jail. But also you should know that over 11 of them have died in prison. Mm. They have died unheard. 
as to whether they were innocent or guilty, nobody will ever know. They were tortured. They are still in jail and had, after six years, mm. the process has just started. For two sittings, they couldn't hear them because they said there was problems with internet, there were problems with Zoom. So th that's why I'm saying we should allow technology to advance so that possibly some of these issues of technological problems, mm. these are issues that we need to acquaint ourselves with. Some of those are not problems, but because we, we are not technically advanced. Mm. So there is no much progress that we can report about on the suffering of our people, some of the children have left school, those whose parents are in jail. Mm -hmm. Some of the wives have been battered in their homes, land has been taken from them. And the poverty situation in those homes is so high. You are finding now children-headed families. So really there isn't much to talk about. Mm. There isn't much to talk about and we still believe so, that our people deserve justice. So you took, did you try to, because it seems like the, the, the judicial system here has kind of pr frustrated the whole process in that issue, in that regard. Have you tried to, to use some other external, you know, processes to make sure that justice is achieved? I don't know which other external processes we can use because I personally, with other leaders from Kasese, we went to meet the president. Mm. We knew that it was his forces that killed people. Those who killed people were not held responsible. Mm -hmm. No accountability was given whatsoever. We even went to the ICC to see whether we can get now the external support. Mm. The efforts in the ICC were equally frustrated. We agreed on certain basics with the head of state and said he was going to do sorting, he was going to ensure that those, because we, we, we even put it to him that there are some people who were arrested who, were, who had never been royal guards. Mm. But people had their own quarrels with individuals and they started pointing, pointing fingers. fingers. Mm. So other people were arrested from their villages, not that they found them at the palace. Other people were arrested because they had leadership problems with Gisos. Other people were arrested because RDCs never liked them. They would say, go and arrest so and so, go and arrest so. So it became a matter of politics. So we told the president this story when we went to meet him as leaders. And mm. we said, it would be very nice that you would let go of some of these issues. But also, the method you used was not the right method. Mm. You couldn't have killed over 150 people just like that. Even if, if it is that they had issues with the nation, there were other methods you could have used than resorting to murder. Well, he said he was going to do certain things which up to now he has never done. And so for me, when I say President Museven is a liar, I will be right in my own view. Mm. Because he lied to us with the leaders of the people that he was going to do sorting. He was going to ensure that they get a speedy trial. That is what uh, we also prayed for. Mm. It has now come to six years before the people are heard. Even those who were given bail, they still report every other day. So there is no happiness in our, in our constituency. Mm. There is barely there is no one who is happy people are sad that their dear ones cannot even be seen and you know they are arrested and dumped here in the prisons of kampala yeah. for someone to visit them they spend over 150 per a visit and they may not allow them to see them they may come and they are not even allowed to see them mm. well sometimes the prison authorities allows them to visit them but you can imagine if you were to visit your dear ones every month. For six years now. For six years now. Every month you are spending 150. Tell me how many of those villagers will be in a position to raise the 150,000 mm -hmm. every month to come and just visit. 
without thinking of maybe carrying someone something for the prisoner. So I know for me that this was a calculated move to first of all cause our people to be poor mm. because the relatives of the people who were arrested have spent and spent money to visit their loved ones. So their financial situation has never remained the same. Majority of these who are in prisons were the breadwinners in their homes. Mm. So you can imagine now the situation in those homes, how it is, it is looking like. So I, he also intended, the leadership of President Museveni intended to create a generation of vulnerability mm. in Kases, and he has achieved it. So all we still ask for is that the, the, the justice system of Uganda should not continue also accelerating the matter. Mm. Let them hear the case. If our people are guilty, let them be charged and, and, they, and, and they serve their sentences. At least they will know that it is They will it's know a that, yeah, it is a period, whether it will be 20 years, they will know that we are counting there. 20 years, 20 yes. years. Mm -hmm. If it is 10 years, it will be 10 years. If they are innocent, let them be set free. But by the time they set them free, they will just be useless. Mm -hmm. Nowhere to begin from. If people who are out of Museveni's prisons are in a dire situation, what will happen to those who are in prisons by the time they come out? Some of them will find no land. People have already oh, grabbed yes, their land. Yes. Some of them will find no marriages. The wives and husbands have already been taken. Some of them will find no children. Some of the children have been defiled. Some of them have been married off at a tender age. Some of them have been made house, uh, house leaders of households. And so the children have not enjoyed their childhood. Mm. For us as people who come from the Renzoris, I think uh, Seven wanted to torture us psychologically. And he has... And he has successfully done it. So if there is anything we have to pay for, is for allowing him to use our territory to come to power. Mm. So we have to pay for that. And for six years, people are in misery, people are in pain. The, there's, there's, are crying. The, there's a, a, a Brian Abigava who is asking that are there some efforts you left while you served as Kasese woman MP that would help to release these victims? Yes, we hired lawyers to ensure they keep following up, but lawyers can't continue following up. I mean, they couldn't do anything when the state is not ready for prosecution. I remember when we went to court and said they have stayed in court, in, in prison, for the 180 days, mandatory. Court sat at night. You can imagine the politics in this case. Court sat at night. By that time, they were still in the magistrate's uh, hands, and they ordered the magistrate to call court at night. The magistrate had told us, we are going to give you the ruling tomorrow, when we, the day after tomorrow. When we came back, Court had started to say, we are now progressing the matter to the competent court. So the magistrate court said, our hands are tied, the matter this has gone to another level, hands, yeah. it's now out of our hands. So all the, like, the, the mechanisms that this one is ask, Brian is asking about, we went and said maybe we can use the aspect of negotiation and mediation. That is how we went to the president. He promised what he did not fulfill. We said, okay, let's go the legal aspect. Went to court and said, now can we use the mandatory period as prescribed by the Constitution? They circumvented it and jumped it. Took the people to the high court and said, you wait until court is ready to hear them. That is how they have had to spend the six years in court. Mm. But we, should, we shall continue advocating for, we can now no longer call it a speedy trial. Because we do also believe in the aspect of justice delayed is mm, justice, justice denied. denied. That's right. And I do uh, believe that I think the, the, the judiciary is out of this. They are just being told what to do in respect well, of this matter. No. Honorable, you, you are one of, you have been a leader at least. Yes. And, and you know, even uh, uh, more than just the people in Kasese who are, you know, killed in that whole... Uh, 
situation. A lot of Ugandans have still been, you know, are being abducted day and night. People are taken from their homes, from their streets. And it's happening. And it seems like most of the systems would run to the justice system that would expect that if I am aggrieved by someone, I should be running here for rescue. Mm. They are also the same people that are probably aiding, even in the process of this, you know, massive prosecution, if I would put it. What, what is left for us? Where do we run to now? You know, to us as alliance for national transformation, that's why we believe that there should be total separation of uh, the institutions of government. Mm. That the judiciary should purely be independent, the executive be independent, and possibly parliament being independent. That each one of them, and that is uh, the nature of democracy, each of these organs is supposed to hold the other accountable. accountable. That's right. These organs were put there for purposes of creating checks and balances. So now the situation that we are in, while Ugandans don't want to believe that we are in a dictatorship, the situation we are in is we are under a state run by an, run by an individual. While everybody thinks I'm going to court, the judges will first ask the president what is the issue in this. Mm. So what the president says is what the judges go by. While parliament is sitting, instead of parliament deciding on behalf of the people, they decide on behalf of the president. When I, see, when I say this, I just draw you back to the example of when we were, Ugandans were all in agreement, irrespective of their political affiliation, that Article 102B should not be amended. The one that talked about the age limit, the age limit. Mm -hmm. and they knew that President M7 had served, they respected him, those who were in the NRM said we respect our leader, but we believe that this article should remain because that is the only safety valve that we are remaining with mm. in our constitution to provide a smooth transition. That's why we are even gambling with this smooth, tra by the way, a smooth transition because all agencies of the state have fused into one individual, the presidency. Mm. So the only way we shall get out of these dilemmas is when we get a situation where the state is using all the other arms of government as provided for in the constitution. And that is why some of us sitting in that parliament were advocating for constitutional reforms because we knew that the constitution as it is now gives a lot of power to the president. As an individual. As an individual. Mm. The president shall. The president shall. The president shall. You can't believe it. The president is the one who ordered the killing of the people in Cassis. But it's the same president who now appoints the judges. To be able to prosecute the people. To be able process. to prosecute the people who are remnants of the ones that he killed. So what do you expect? That the judges will burn the fingers that feed them. Quite unlikely. So we, we, we thought that possibly if there are other mechanisms through which these organs can be held independent, it is the same struggle that we are in when we talk about electoral reforms, when we talked about electoral reforms in the Citizens' Compact on Free and Fair Elections, we thought we could have an independent electoral commission. The president appoints the commissioners, including the chairman of the electoral commission, <laughs> and he comes into an election as a candidate. <laughs> but now look at a situation where you are in a football match. <laughs> yeah, One of the players has appointed the referees one of the players has, a point, has even been in position to see which ground you are going to use. He's the one who has appointed the linesman. And he's a player. <laughs> would you be in a position to, to win such a... Him. To score against him. That, that, that would so be the moment we all keep quiet about these ills that are happening in our country, and we keep saying it is for them, to the extent that when the Kasese massacre happened, it became the Bakonzo issue. Mm -hmm. When the Kampala massacre happened in 2020, it became a Nupu issue. When the Vijambia people went into massacre, it became an issue for them. And we Ugandans remain silent. They will come for you and nobody will be there to speak for you. 
So we better all speak sense to our leaders and tell them that life matters much more than anything. Mm. But I also know that when we get afraid of speaking to power, that becomes one of the problems that we encounter and we begin nurturing dictators without knowing. Mm. By the way, dictators do not make themselves. We make them. We make them. They make mistakes and we start glorifying them. That is why you see people kneeling down to say President Museveni is all candidate. What does that mean? You are telling is, the man... Is it, is it an issue of losing hope and knowing that there is nothing you can do to change they it? Are build, they are breeding a dictator. What should they And do? I know that majority of them have the capacity to lead this country. If most of them who have spoken most have ended up in the dungeons of, you know, of security. That is, that is the dictator they have bred. You know when you keep a snake in your house... Don't think one day it will never feast on you. If it doesn't feast on you, it will feast on your children. Mm. So, to us as Ugandans, we are duty bound to free our country of dictators and of those who think alike. Okay. Honorable, thank you so much. We're going to go in for a very short commercial break. We come back in the next hour. You should be able to participate in this conversation. You can put in your comment or your question in the comment section of our social media handles, which is Facebook, The Alternative Uganda and Digitalk TV. I will be able to read your questions and your comments in the second hour that we're coming to. In the second hour, I think we'll begin with the whole issue, the hot one, the one about the, 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 the Nairobi. I want to call it the Nairobi issue. Uh, that one wants to understand because Honorable is one of the people who are actually attending that particular conference and, and the p things that have been said about the, the, the current Minister of Internal Affairs saying that the people should actually be investigated if not arrested for treason, as he said that what they did in Kenya actually amounted to treason. And we want to look at what that actually means and, and, and why in the first place did they have to take it to Kenya, Nairobi. And maybe that will give us a perspective into why it actually happened and, who, and what next after now. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Fellow citizens, following the sequence of events, Uganda seems to be at political crossroads. I'm not a servant of anybody. <laughs> Madam, I know the law. As such, Alternative Digital brings you the Interfest show with retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesuje. Let's keep on the same page on Alternative Digital. As he gives you the alternatives on the transition question, rule of law, human rights and freedom, youth inclusion in governance, economic stagnation as he confirms. I'll be always here Saturday from 10 a.m. in the morning. Be there. Don't miss the live discussion on the Alternative Uganda, Digitalk TV Facebook pages and the Alternative Uganda YouTube channel. The Alternative Dig Talk. Real issues. Real talk. Welcome back from that short commercial uh, uh, break, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Roger Studiawe, and together uh, on the set today is Honorable Winnie Chiza, the first ever uh, woman leader of opposition, the former now. Uh, but also, I think she led uh, 
you know, opened the gate for the women in, in that parliament. And she set a ground for women leadership in this country. And, and one who a lot of us actually look up to. I am one of those people who are inspired by what she does as an individual. But now, Honorable, we want to begin with uh, the whole the Nairobi issue. We understand that I think it was last month, yes. the, 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 the most, I think it was the opposition, let me carry it all together, had a conference in Nairobi where a lot of uh, torture vic victims were assembled and, 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 you know, said to have been, to have received all those uh, issues, w most with broken legs, some without arms, others with different injuries, to have said that those injuries were inflicted by security uh, agents of the uh, current government. Uh, wh what was the whole achievement behind this whole thing? As in, what was the target of the meeting? And would you say that it was actually achieved? Well, I would like to thank the Kenya Human Rights Commission mm. for enabling us to gather together as members of the opposition in Uganda and as defenders of human rights. Mm. One, we do acknowledge the fact that we are in uh, the East African community. That's right. And to that, we treat each other as brothers and sisters. That's what the protocol tells us to do, mm. that we should b treat each other as brothers and sisters. It's sad that at the time we went to Nairobi, they were still nursing the, the, the attacks by one of our generals who had said if he were given only two <laughs> weeks, he would have you couldn't overtake them. Overtaken in Nairobi and we had so many explanations to make. Mm. Though the president, who is the father, had sent in apologies to the Kenyan people. Mm. But this specific conference was talking about the human rights accountability on the side of Uganda. Has Uganda accepted that they are violating human rights? Has Uganda accepted as a country? When I talk about Uganda, I talk about our leaders. Have they agreed that they are in breach of the many protocols, international and national, to which we are party? Mm. So, and like you hear what Kahindo Tafire said, such a meeting wouldn't have taken place here. But we had to pour out our hearts. We had to talk to the victims of this state uh, instigated violence. Majority of the victims that gave their testimonies of the horrors that they went through mm. under the hands of the state agents have never gotten anyone to speak to. Many of them still live in fear. Some of them up to now are still being hunted by security. Mm. So the only person that gave them leverage to go and speak, to go and air out their grievances was the Kenya Human Rights Commission. And the issue there was that Uganda cannot give us an opportunity to speak, mm. it can't allow us to breathe. And I'm not surprised that the Minister of Internal Affairs is saying that was a treasonable act. So do you think we could have sat here? So, so the conference happened on the invitation of the Kenyan Human Rights Commission? Yes, it was arranged by the Kenya Human Rights Commission and they, they are concerned that these issues are happening and nobody is holding anybody accountable. They are police officers and army officers who shot people in broad daylight yes. and nobody wants to even talk about it. Just like it happened in 2016 in Kasese, if someone comes from there and says, yes, I killed them, yeah. and he's promoted in ranks for killing people, and you still continue saying, we believe in the fundamentals of human rights, we believe in the protocols on people and the human rights. So we said, look here, there must be someone to hold our people accountable. And the Kenya Human Rights Commission gave us a platform to air out our views. And I'm sure Uganda was listening. It was, I would say. That is why they can talk about it. It was not done in secret. We went to just the neighbor to say, look, can you go and speak to your brothers across and tell them to begin respecting the protocols 
and the treaties to which Uganda is a party? Can they respect human rights? That when you go into a campaign, when you go into an election, this is an issue that is known by our constitution. We carry out elections every, after five, five years. years. Mm -hmm. But this should not be a matter of life and death. If you think you are so popular, then why continue killing people? Why continue beating up people? The drones have become drones. And the ones who are carrying these people are known. Security officers who are supposed to secure Ugandans are the ones that are torturing them, are the ones that are making the, the country insecure. We don't have thieves. We are not attacked by foreigners. Yes. We, are atta we are actually afraid of the security officers than we can be afraid of no, the, the rebels foreign invasion. for foreign invasion. Mm. So what do we do? Because we can't speak here, we, our Uganda Human Rights Commission can't convene such a gathering. The neighbor was willing to help us gather so that we could send our message back home and say, please respect the fundamental principles of human rights. And these people you have rendered useless. Can you see how you use the transitional justice mechanisms possibly? to ensure that you repair the victims. But they are those whose humanity has been degenerated, mm -hmm. has been degraded to the point that even if they were repaired, they are beyond repair. What do you do to a man that has been castrated to put him back into shape? What do you do to a person whom you forced to drink blood of a victim of HIV? What do you do to a human being whose limbs you cut just because you want to overstay in power? So when Kaindo Tafire cries out and says those will be charged with the treason, I don't blame him because that is what his <laughs> boss maybe thinks. And that is the reason the meeting couldn't take place here because many people have been asking, why couldn't you have your meeting here? Mm -hmm. We couldn't have it here because the condition was not favorable. But also, Honorable, in that, just a second, in that uh, particular regard, we have had uh, quite, I would say, meetings, some like that, not particularly like this one, yeah. but in this kind of uh, issue in this area about security, we have had conferences, we have had uh, workshops, those things happen around time and again. Mm -hmm. But there seems to, na to, to not have made any difference thus far. What, what, are the, what faith did you have, or do you still have, that the conference that was convened in Nairobi will actually bring results? You know, in conflict resolution, mm -hmm. one of the things that you do to help the victim is to enable them to speak. Yeah. To kind of release the, the yeah, steam. Mm -hmm. Only to get someone to speak to helps you to heal. So even to give them a listening ear, because they have never gotten anyone to speak to them, was sufficient enough. To us, we achieved that, to enable them to speak. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank the Kenya Human Rights Commission for that, for enabling our victims to at least speak. Two, we know the state we are dealing with. They are the offenders. We know that they might not do much, but at least let the world know that even when we append our signatures to international protocols and conventions, we don't respect, respect them. them. Mm. That was another achievement that we made. So that anybody who deals with President Museveni's government deals with them cautiously, knowing that this that they have signed, you know we are quick at signing them. Mm. This they have signed, there is a probability <laughs> of not working. honoring. Mm that we achieved. So, we know that they are those who didn't even know that Ugandans we are going through this. Because they are people who say, you know, we have achieved peace in Uganda. President M7 has brought peace. How do you preach peace to such a person and their family? And you say you have brought peace. When you yourself, you are the very person who is plucking out their nails, who is castrating them, 
who is killing people in prison mbuya this cmi, CMI mm. is packed those who have been there will tell you that cmi is packed with people who have been there for months and had they are tortured every other day people are in safe houses they call them safe for i think for lack of a better word but people are being tortured and you say we brought peace do you think those ones are saying yes you brought peace so we want to let the world know that even when we are in this utopia Uganda is not peaceful and we are not at peace not that because we have external forces fighting us mm. but because our leaders are fighting the population it is so funny it sounds funny that the leaders are the ones fighting they the population people. they are people mm. and yet they are supposed to be our leaders they are supposed to fight for us they are one of us they are brothers and they sisters. are supposed to fight for us mm. but now they are fighting us and we continue giving them our votes if we have been giving them anyway but the fact that they beat people to get elected the fact that they will not want agents at polling stations mm. is enough to show that they know that they are unpopular and that the population doesn't want them that's why they act the way they act so to us we are able to prove to the world that you know many times we talk that Museven is a dictator Museven violates human rights Museven does this and they just say that is all because of the opposition mm. but when these people came out to speak i can tell you everybody in the room was speechless people started weeping and asking can a nation led democratically go through this and we said yes that is what we go through So honorable what what do you have to say about the allegations that some of the people who are actually assembled were not victims of the state sponsored torture that some of them actually had had you know their legs cut off or arms or whatever they were suffering or whatever had become of them from random accidents that happen every day that some of them were actually you know the police the police will tell you there were random accidents when we saw the police vans ride r- driving okay. over them mm. so they will say they were just random accidents let them prove that those are not the people that they ran over as someone will tell you i extended but that that picture you must even be having it here where a police van is chasing them and driving over them so how let them okay bring a list of those they think they have tortured mm. then we can know that those are not part of them but some of them have police bonds anyway after they had been tortured they were brought to their police stations and, and given a bond bonds, yes. So how do you say you have given me police bond and you say you, you are not responsible for the torture? Let police give us a list of those they think they have tortured. Mm. Just like they gave us a list of whom they think they have killed on the Kampala streets in 2020. Mm. They read a list of 54 people and said, "A list for us as a state we acknowledge that we have killed 54." <laughs> as if those 54 were animals. Yes, yes. impunity so at least we are able to let the world understand that the country we are living in is a country that whose leadership has become hostile to the population while the population would want to respect the leadership the leadership has less regard to the mere basic fundamentals mm. of human rights the mere basic fundamentals of providing security and safety for person and property Have we I, are able to at least let that out of yeah, the unknown that's right mm-hmm. having been one of the people who have been at CMI <laughs> mm-hmm. I, i would not so much as uh, you know be on the other side i know what it <laughs> feels and or what it is actually to be at that hill mm-hmm. it is a place you do not want to be but now so it 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 means that it is only the the posturing of the security to say that some of the people who were assembled were actually random accidents if they say they were random accidents let them prove let them tell us the ones they have tortured mm. and then they say this one is not part of the ones that we have tortured 
they were accident victims and then they tell us the particular time when that accident happened because they should be having records of these accidents and you know along Masaka Road Winnie Kiza got an accident and the, she lost her leg mm. and here we have the evidence we can say okay maybe they were random accidents accidents some of mm. but let them also tell us that yes we accept the other one we tortured and this one we didn't touch it is now up to them to prove otherwise the people went there we know them as victims of, uh, so, uh, of uh, torture uh, we know them that they are victims of state instigated violence mm. let them prove otherwise as, as a part of, of that conference or the aftermath at least have you also thought about maybe maybe just maybe engaging the, 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 the executive of this country to say that, look, these people have suffered this and that. What do you have any kind of reparations? What, what do you have to say about this? We, or at we, least for the allegations that they say. You know, they when, the when the state says some of them are not part of the ones we tortured, then we expect them to say, look, come and we talk. Mm. Because for us, we are helpless. Or at least we agree that there are some of them we tortured. Yes, well, we agree that there are some of them we tortured and mm. say, now, the ones that we tortured, what do you think we should do? But because they are this full of themselves, they feel this sense of entitlement, they feel they did a great job, and then there were some of them were pampered for doing a great job of torturing people. Some of them got promotions. Yeah, they did. So those who got promotions out of torturing people will continue to torture because they also want promotions. Promotions... Uh, go with something, a bigger pay. <laughs> so if you must kill people and then you get a better pay, you get recognized, you get acceptance, you must continue doing it again and again. If people were punished for the wrongs they committed, then nobody else would want to do them. Mm. Okay. So there is no way we can say that they should, uh, we, we should go and talk because first of all, they don't want to tell us that they are the ones who did what? Who tortured. Mm. And even if they tortured, they did it with joy. So how do you go to such a vampire? That's right. Okay, so I hope that uh, with Ugandans that there will actually be some results from that conference. I hope there will be some reactions. Actually, I think two days ago, we had uh, the UK government sanction on uh, Major, is it a general cadet holder? Uh -huh. They sanctioned him for what he had done as when he was the when police he chief. was still in office. Yeah. We but know no, that this meeting will continue yielding results. Mm. Maybe the, the Kenyan government should also take it up. We also through that meeting requested the Kenya Human Rights Commission to pass our grievances over to their counterparts in Uganda, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, mm. because uh, human rights really are. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 we are in a bad space. We, we, you, you, everybody deserves to be respected. We are human beings mm. and we need to be treated as such. When you degrade a human being to just a mere animal and possibly a beast, then there is no reason for them to keep living. Mm. And if they think we are these animals, then they should not even keep coming to us for votes. So that is why we think that the issue, we, we can't continue saying we are sisters when we can't be in a position to hold each other as a, a, accountable. Mm. Kenya as a sister to Uganda needs to take up the responsibility of being the brother's keeper. Keep us as we keep them. And they say here we come, we believe you have been doing this. And we thought that possibly, it is also our desire that mm. after talking, instead of branding us as terrorists and criminals and possibly they say now that is an act of treason let them address the issues that we are talking about because these issues affect all of us yes, the issues affect productivity of the country when you look at the happiness index of Ugandans you may find that it is low compared to how it was maybe some 10 years ago mm. Why? Because of some of these acts and atrocities. So that's why we think that instead of blaming the, peop the victims, now they want to victimize them the more. I'm told they have started reaching out to some, to families, some, of, yeah, to yeah. some families to tell them your son is an ADF, your son is a terrorist, 
and now you know your daughter is like this because they want again to implicate them into some other issues and torture them into why they went to, to kill. testify mm. as victims. But this is not the country that we desire to live in. Okay, so I hope that uh, we expect more than the, the conference itself. We that expect that, that, our leaders, that our leaders will accept responsibility I, 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 and find mechanisms mm. of making good. Did you invite some of the leaders who are maybe, let's say, the members of parliament or the, the ones in the executive, let's say, to, to, to also witness this kind of thing and say, look, we, you are presiding over our country. But these are things that are happening under your These world. are issues that we have talked. But the more we talk, the more we bring trouble to ourselves. So that's why we ran to our sisters and brothers and say, can you intervene? There is this happening in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Maybe before you know it, the vice may cross over to your land. So the earlier they also think of talking about it, the better. Mm -hmm. Though I know that our, uh, our good leaders will hide behind the issue of sovereignty and say we are a sovereign state. We don't we want to be advised. We don't want country. you to interfere with our issues. But if you have accepted to go into a relationship with Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Congo, South Sudan, Burundi, mm -hmm. then you accept to be criticized by them, accept to be advised by them. Because these are our sisters and we belong to a common destiny. Okay, so the only thing we can have now is hope that something is going to come out of that and that our Uganda Human Rights Commission also comes through. Only that most of the people have actually said that itself, they do not make their own decisions. Their decisions are also subject to someone's input also. <laughs> but moving on from that, I also wanted us to talk a little bit about the debt burden of this country. Mm. We currently stand at 80, per 80 trillion Uganda shillings, our mm. national debt. And uh, I read some statistics that said that about 90% of uh, the money that is collected, revenue internal collection, the local revenue collected, goes to debt servicing yes. and, and uh, recurrent expenditures. Yes. Which means that literally our budget, the actual development agenda, is only done by the 10%. The 10%, the, the, the 10 <laughs> and the money that we borrow. Mm. Which literally means that every time for us to finance our budget, we might have to borrow again and again and make yeah. sure that we, 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 suffer, we, we keep this uh, in shape and going. What, what, what do we have to do as a country to get out of this thing, do you think? Or not? Just like you have said, Uganda as a country is in problems. We were interacting at another show with the permanent secretary. Mm. And the permanent secretary was posturing that the economy is well. But on the same day, Bank of Uganda was meeting with members of parliament and they were saying the economy is not well. Ugandans should know that we are depending on borrowings. Just like you have put it, we are, we are getting closer to 80% of our internally generated revenue to be servicing debts. Mm. We are at 83 by December, by June. Of this, year. of this year, we were at 73 tri trillion in terms of debt. So in the margin of eight, so, six months? Yes, in, by, it is an accumulation. Mm. We have been borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. So even when we have a, a 40, is it 48 trillion budget, mm. yeah, right our now. budget is lower than the debts that we have. I mean is, is lower than the debts that we have. That is why a bigger percentage of our budget is going to debt resurfacing. resurfacing. Now when we go into debt resurfacing, it means we shall not do as much as we should have done. What that, does that mean? That we shall continue borrowing. borrowing to service. Now we have even reached an extent of even borrowing to pay salaries. That is where we are as a country. Borrow to pay Salary. salaries. We have all along been telling government that the cost of administration is so high. Many people who crave for districts, constituencies, should know what it means to have these institutions and structures in place. Mm -hmm. 
as we open our country to having more and more districts, then we are bringing in more and more people who are increasing on the debt burden, the cost of administration. As we have a cabinet of 80 plus members, ministers, all those are costs that we are meeting. So much of the money that would have gone into social service delivery it goes into administration. Goes into administration, paying salaries, servicing now the debt. And those are constant money. And those are constant monies that happen, that happen again again. every month. Mm. You don't have to miss a month. If you are to miss a month, then people must expect areas. Mm. Whether you have the Either money or not, it. you will have to pay it. That mm. is where the government again ends up going into borrowing. I remember there is a time in the parliament when we borrowed money. And they were telling us they were going to pay the areas of health workers then. In the, nine, in the tenth parliament. Mm. We borrowed, we allowed the government to borrow the money, but they didn't. You know, much of the areas that we have as government, as, as a country, areas are in terms of passion, areas are in terms of the services that people do with the government, those mm. who are doing construction with the government, mm. those who have supplied us things as government. They have supplied the nation certain things and we have not paid them. And you should know that government is the biggest business provider. Yes, so true. when government holds people's money, that means the society out there will go without money. Many people have gone into debts to try to do government's work. There is a construction, they will say we have given you a tender. Mm. You go and borrow against this uh, contract that they have given you. You borrow money, you do the contract, they pay you maybe after four years where you borrowed the money it the has accumulated, yes. the interest has eaten all the money together with the profits and you remain in debts. Many people are selling their properties because they must service the debts they incurred to do government work. That is the condition in which we are. And I don't see any political will to get us on track in terms of revamping the economy. Why? Me, I would think our government and the leaders are interested in perpetually keeping us poor so that, you know, a poor person doesn't make serious decisions. Mm. That is why they will get into a community and they buy you rukumi rukumi or 1,000 and you are able to surrender your vote at 1,000 because mm. you must continue surviving. So you become perpetually vulnerable and you keep at the mercy of the dictator. That is why I think for me it is intentional. But Two, but, mm. you will find that the head of state will conveniently give out handouts to people knowing that these handouts, they will not put them to proper use. Because first of all, they have no plan for the use. They have not planned to receive that money. So what they will do is to go drink it and remain in the same shape, but singing praises to him. But much of this money is borrowed. We even borrow money and we use it for things for which we, we, that, are, not intended that to do. we are not intended to do. Mm. Borrow money to do agriculture. You first use it to pay salaries and you are to pay, you begin even paying the interest before you use the money for the purpose for which you borrowed it. By the time you say now we have assembled some more money, it has depreciated. Mm. And you are no longer now in position to do You are no longer in position for. to do the job for which you borrowed the money at the same amount. Mm. So these are the positions we are in. So don't think we have hunger for no good reason. Even when uh, sustainable development goal number two forces us to have a hunger free society by 2030, I'm not so sure that with our planning, Uganda is about to have a hunger-free society. But, but, but also, Honorable, how, how do you talk about uh, 
the people, because part of the problem actually we have had, and especially with finances, is corruption. Yes. And embezzlement. And most of it, of it, yes, we would agree that it goes to the government, most of them. I think, according to the IGG, I think over 10 trillion. The IGG's is report lost. Mm. was indicating that every hour, one million is disappearing in a government office. One hour like this. Every hour like this. One million is disappearing in a government office. You can imagine how many hours are in a year? Yes, due to corruption. For each million? Yes. Every hour it is disappearing. That is to the minimum. In every government office. So check how many offices they are. And just know that every hour, one million is disappearing in mm. any of those offices. Mm. So even when we have borrowed the money, when we take it, maybe if we have chosen to put it to the reason for which we borrowed it, then another bunch of it is lost to corruption. Mm. At least enough of it will have been spo spoiled in other things other than the reason for which it was borrowed. So as a country, I think there is no serious political will to sort the economy. There is no political will to end the misery of the people. The World Food Program report indicated that 29% uh, of our children who are below the age of five are stunted. It further indicated that 19.7% of Uganda's population is below the poverty, the poverty line. line. Mm. And when you still have a population that is below the poverty line, definitely you will not fail to have a hungry population. That's possible. Majority of them will die of hunger. The fact that they are below the poverty line. And, you know, it's a duty of government to ensure that citizens are given the basic opportunities and state policy 14 gives us these rights and opportunities a right to education a right to security a right to food a right to the basic needs mm. so if people are dying of hunger it means the state has abdicated on its responsibilities of ensuring that the population is having access to security it's having access to food Food security is part of what we should talk about. So we need to address the issue of climate change. We need to put more money in agriculture because over 70% of our population is employed in agriculture. In agriculture. Mm. So if you can leave just 70% of the population to fat and you keep guessing on whether there will be rain or not, then it means you are not capable of holding your population together. Mm. We know that Uganda is one of the countries really naturally gifted by God. Good climate, good weather, that is what we talk about. Fertile soils, that's what we talk about. But we are also aware that we have some arid conditions that's right. which need to be addressed. We have some other areas that are unfortunate don't have these nice uh, fertile soils. I need to be supported possibly with fertilizers. We have other areas that experience severe droughts and yet they have rivers. If I may just give an example of Kasese, we have a line of over 12 rivers flowing through Kasese. Flowing through Kasese to the extent of even causing terrible floods that misplace people. Mm but we still suffer from hunger because the place is sometimes experiences droughts. We only just want our government to do us a favor, if I will call it so, but they are doing their job as mm. commanded by state directive, under the principles of, of the state principles, mm. policy number 14, that they have a duty to secure us in terms of food security, education and whatever. And I thought possibly if they would do irrigation with these rivers, mean irrigation schemes to support the people to grow food as and when they want because they have land. Mm. 
but we still want to wait for Mother Nature to water these crops. Sometimes they will dry, sometimes the rains are too much, and we can't control them. We get poor harvests. Mm. Either way, it is extreme. Either way, it is extreme. When mm. the rains come, they will they come, come and, and cause disaster. Much. When the, the mm. sunshine comes, it will come and cause disaster. But can we be guided by a good government that will say, look, maybe you can go into green housing, mm. or greenhouse farming. Can you do some irrigation schemes? Maybe they can be used to tap some of the water that causes commotion and you do, you do farming during the dry spell. Mm. All these can be achieved if we have a government that cares for its population and wants to sort the economic pressures that the population is entangled with. Mm. And by doing so, we shall also be able to answer the question of hunger that we are expect, experiencing in our country. Yes, Honorable, I wanted you also to talk about the, the we, as we were talking about corruption and embezzlement. And I think some years back, we had the president say that, look, if uh, someone is stealing money, but they are keeping at, uh, it here locally, it means somehow it is also benefiting some people somewhere so you can let those f go. So it keeps us wondering, in a situation where the people who are embezzling are left scot free mm. and the economy is literally crumbling. Where do we, what, what are we going to do now? You know, when you are a parent How do we grow when a you are now? when you are a parent in the home mm. and you see your child is stealing sugar and you just say, ah, it is my sugar, you know, it is our sugar, let the mm. child just eat. Before you know it, you will see your child going to the neighbors and start stealing chicken. Before you know it is on the streets as a highway robber. Mm. So when the IGG wanted to do a lifestyle audit and the president said, no, 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 don't touch my people. Me, I just knew that is what he was all along. President Museven has never had political will to fight corruption. When he wants to fight corruption, he will go to the small people. These small cows who steal 5 million, <laughs> who steal 20 million, he will go for those. But those who steal in billions, why he doesn't want to go for them? Because majority of them are appointed by him and therefore they are known to him. Majority of those in, who are building big, big houses out of corruption, are the ones that are close to him, are the ones that are financing his campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So somehow he's also trapped between a hard place and a rock. Oh, okay. Should I touch them, they stop funding me. And I still need another Chisanja since he doesn't want to rest. Should I leave them? And the population will say. But eventually he had to say, please leave them. As long the as they are saving within here. What do you think they did? They clapped and said, okay, we shall continue stealing done. and building it here. But does this money go to everybody in the countryside? When they build here arcades and malls, do they spend in Amuru? I do not. I do they spend in Kabari? It ends here. And the majority of them get their money, take it abroad. So it doesn't really necessarily transform the lives of the ordinary persons. So corruption is corruption. If we are to fight it, we must fight it from the top to the mm. bottom. Yes, right. Let's not look at the small offenders who don't have political godfathers and we say we are fighting corruption so that when I'm arrested, I will not say it is political witch hunt. When you are arrested, you know that it is real. They are fighting. It is a war against all of us. And that's why me, I loved the late speaker Olanya when he said, Mr. President, all of us are corrupt. Your wife is corrupt. I'm also corrupt. And my wife is corrupt. All of us are corrupt. Mm. And if we are to fight it, all of mm. us must fight. Mm. But with any fight, there will always be a commander. And the foot soldiers or the soldiers will always listen to the voice of the, the commander. commander. Right. So when the commander says, eh, 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 go slow my corrupt people, what do you expect them to do? To continue thieving and building here. 
They are going to build their empires, so you will find the gap between the rich and the poor is very big. becoming bigger and bigger that our people will lack medicines in the hospitals. The roads will be impassable. We shall go to the schools and we find malnourished children because what is supposed to take care of them has been swindled. But remember, these who are accessing free money, we go to the same markets with them. We take children to the same schools. So when they think there is a lot of money, maybe they are even the owners of the schools, they will hype the fees mm. because there are some people who can afford. They will go to the market and buy at any price and the people will think that is supposed to be the rate the at which price, we should yes. buy. Mm. So for you who is not a thief, you will go to the same market and you will find a bunch of matoke at 30,000 and you can't afford it. While to them who are doing it and keeping it within the country, 30,000 is just useless. That is what they give to kids to go and buy just sweets, sweets, sweets and yeah. ice cream. Now, Honorable, I also want in that same regard, now, because now when you say that some people are going to be left scot-free when they're embezzlers, it has a cost on the economy. But also we have had this issue of uh, the extravagant incentives that we have given, especially to the foreign investors. Now, some people have asked if that actually does contribute to our economy in the long run. Does it have, uh, invite more foreign, foreign direct investment or does it even cripple our economy? You know, we have for a long time discouraged government from the so-called investors. Mm. I would love to see an investor coming in and saying, I'm going to invest in agriculture. And then my country tells me, Winnie, do you have land? There is someone who wants to invest in agriculture, partner with the person. Mm. For you, you have land, let him bring his money, and you do serious agriculture with the person. Mm. Mm. So I will know he's building my capacity. He's liberating me economically. Maybe even the villagers that are my neighbors will equally get small jobs on that farm. But when someone comes and is saying, I'm an investor, you give free land like we did to Pineti. <laughs> and give them the money to even invest. When they we mean we gave to Luboa. You give free land, then you go an extra mile and borrow for them, and you call them investors. What are they investing? <laughs> investing for them. Now, when they come, <laughs> they invest and they will bring over 50% of their nationals to, 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 work to get the high-paying jobs as expatriates. Mm. Then the bigger sums of money to the workers is given to the, to the foreigners and our people are left as casual laborers. Mm taking home peanuts when the cream of the money has been taken by the so-called investors, relatives, and friends. And you say you are developing us? How? The money that we are taking into the ventures and investments of these called investors is not banked in our, in our banks. Do we need policies for investors to know that we when We put you come? policies, but these policies are hijacked by the leadership. Because look, we even put a, a law on local content. Mm. And we said any investor that comes, for heaven's sake, let the investor ensure that more than 50% remains here of the employees hey, are, are from, from here. here. Mm. Now when we say the 50%, now they gave us 50% of the casual of the of the, of the, of the, the casual laborers. Mm. We say if you are to purchase, mm. you must purchase our foods. You know, we were again speaking to the people from Obunyoro. The Obunyoro were saying when we had oil coming to our area, we went into the building of hotels, thinking that the workers in Obunyoro will come and sleep in our hotels, those who are coming as uh, foreigners. Mm. They thought their children were going to get jobs. Before they know it, they are being pushed out of the areas, relocated without any compensation, and they feel they have been cheated. 
those who went into taking care of chicken, thinking that they will be selling their chicken to the workers, the chicken was coming from South Africa. Those who thought they will be selling their matoke, these people go into buying now they already made matoke from <laughs> elsewhere. And the people said, but we are not even enjoying any benefits of being into the oil city. On top of being chased away from in, their in, On top of being chased from our lands, the mm. only benefit we are getting are children with uh, other children who are not having fathers. They started having Chinese giving, producing from their children and they disappear. They leave Chinese children, now they call them oil babies. <laughs> they have only the oil babies who are fatherless. So some of these issues really need Makes a sense. firm commitment from the leadership because I know that Uganda is good at making policies. But as to whether those policies are actualized is a big issue. It's another issue altogether. It's another issue. We can continue as a country to say, yes, we welcome investors and mm. they are welcome. Yeah. But which type of investors do we bring? And Some of us do even think that mm. the so-called investors, we just manufacture them, but and we want to use them to rob the country. Behind every investor, if you went asking, you will find there is a someone who is a Ugandan. A Ugandan. Someone. That, that is why even with the Pinetti's coffee, eventually the, the Pinetti <laughs> came out and said, by the way, Pinetti had no... <laughs> the actual Pinetti. Yes, the actual Pinetti <laughs> came out and said, by the way, Pinetti had no clue on coffee. It was actually me who went for Pinetti. <laughs> and yet they had told us Pinetti is an expert in coffee matters. Mm, who has come from so we area. have so many Pinettis masquerading around as being investors when actually the actual investors are hiding behind them. That is why it is not easy to fight corruption. Honorable, we are running out of time. Timothy Wamai asks, Honorable, you have heard your senior Dr. Chizavisage's message on how mere elections can't transfer power to the captured citizens. Do you agree? with Dr. Vesige's thought towards elections. If not, how different will ANT organize and win such elections and subsequently change this narrative? You know, to some extent, I agree with Dr. Vesige. Mm. The fact that we still have an electoral commission appointed by President Museveni, uh, the courts, the judiciary appointed by President Museveni to the extent that when you lose an election and you are running to court, the courts will concur with what the president wants mm. and that the playing field is not leveled to that extent, I say that a mayor election may not be of use. May be of use. However, to us in the ANT, we believe that if you are organized, we can overwhelm them. Why do we say so? I give an example of Kasese, for example, where mm. I was a member of parliament. Mm. We went through the same election, we organized ourselves. That is why for us we are working seriously on building of structures. The areas where we had farm structures as FDC then, we won the areas. Mm. Went to Kasese, we had a fully prepared, well-structured political system that worked. Kasese had to bring six MPs out of six to parliament. Our candidate, the presidential candidate, won in Kasese. We went to Amuru. We had a well-serviced political system. Mm. Had people, leaders from the grassroots to, to the district. Amuru voted almost 100% for the FDC. And basing on those two scenarios, we do believe that if Ugandans, using that model, building systems, and I mean, when I talk about systems, I mean the political institution, mm. building family from the grassroots to the district level and subsequently to the national level, we get our people to guard the election, they may never win us. Kasese was a contested one. I went through it by election. All of us were witness to this. But because we had a force that was on the ground, well-structured political system, other friends came from uh, the other districts and came and beefed us up. 
Even with his armies and forces, Museven could not win that by election. So for me, I still believe that we can achieve democracy using an election. If we in the opposition or we the forces of change can believe in unity, can believe in building firm structures on the ground, we can cause that change. Van John says, nice to hear from the voice of wisdom, Honorable Nichiza. Uh, we have a lot of people who are watching, Sam Ogans, Germany, Brooke Williams. There's a lot of them, I can't break them down. This one says, uh, Honorable Winnie, an accomplished leader. This is Kasule Ismail. Ah. I say, it has risen through the leadership ranks to get to where she is today. She is a team player, very social and a down to earth woman who freely associates with all people, regardless of their class. One of a few politicians who are not proud. <laughs> Thank you, Isma. <laughs> she is a potential presidential candidate. <laughs> <laughs> President of Materi, you'll come 2026. I, I wonder if you have... Uh, when we have built the systems in yeah. our, would, would politi in our political party, we want to build a system that will ensure that whoever contests wins the election. Would, whether would, it will be winning, <laughs> or whether it will be who. Okay. That she will says, be determined by uh, the political party that I come from. Okay, uh, Magara Brown says, live from Kampala, Nyakato, Rusoke. Wow. Says, I cannot agree more. Thank you, Honorable Oni Chiza. To me, uh, Chiza Zek says, thanks, Honorable Oni Chiza, for the great words. She has nailed it on the oil hoima issue. Oil babies who are fatherless. <laughs> Ronald <laughs> Muinda says, who will allow you to build structures? <laughs> he said, who will allow you to build structures at the grassroots without dismantling them? If mm. Seven could stop existence of parties from 1986 to 2000, mm -hmm. you think he can allow now parties to build structures to remove him from power using an election? Well, then, you know, that is what we have kept telling people that we need to also sit as uh, opposition actors. Because even when we think we shall not use a ballot mm. to remove him, we need to plan. That's right. We need to strategize. And we can only do that if we are in one accord mm, and in harmony, we are organized. There isn't any achievement we shall get if we don't organize. All right. So organization, organization, and organization with the strategy. Honorable, we can have now your closing remarks because time is literally... I passed. want to thank all those who have been watching, who have been following, and all those who have sent in their messages, and I say thank you. I know that Uganda is in a state where all of us want to see change. Mm. Though I know many of the people don't know how, I know someday that change will happen. It may take time, but it will, but it will happen. Mm. We shall come here to say, we told you that change will happen. If by 25th I have not seen many of you, I want to say Merry Christmas and a happy new year to all of you. May the blessings that come with the birth of Jesus Christ be upon you and your households, and may the peace that comes with the Prince of Peace be upon all of us as we pray for change in our country, as we pray for the leadership that cares for its people, as we pray that those in leadership find reason to repent of the sins they have committed to Ugandans. You can't be leaders of people whom you continuously murder, whom you torture, whom you subject to poverty, and you don't repent. That is the essence of the birth of Jesus Christ, that you may have that peace and have it in fullest. I want to thank you. May God bless you. May God bless Uganda for God and my country. Thank you so much, Honorable. No wonder you're principal, and I think that comes from your Christianity <laughs> side and the love of God. Thank you, gen uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being with us all through uh, on this hotline show. My name uh, is Roger Sturiawe, and it has been a privilege to host Honorable Enichiza today. One of those leaders I really admire. I think the people who have stand, stood by principle and led by values and examples. I have seen very few people who have said that I have led this far, and I think it's important that someone should step in and maybe give us a fresh look at things I could have done better, but maybe someone else will give us a better result. I think that is very important, Honorable. We thank you so much for your service to the country and what you still do even outside the parliament. 
We thank you so much. And uh, from myself and the people from Alternative Dig Talk, we say thank you so much. Have yourselves a very good evening. Uh, shout out to Kato, uh, who has been on camera, turned your head in the worker and control room. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for making it happen. Good night. <laughs>